losses have occurred at Marshall since the time of the young thundering herd. The football stadium now brims with 40,000. The marching thunder is 300 strong, and students study throughout the world. Marshall has evolved into a world-class university. It has set the stage for many students aspiring to greater heights and prepared them to perform at the highest level. Biotech, science, and the medical school have a new home for research. Tomorrow's teachers learn in future classrooms, and dorms have become learning communities with free cell phones. From library stacks to the fastest technology, information flow now comes at an instant. Yet, with the changing university, many things remain. Marshall is a safe, secure campus located in a vibrant community. That's just part of why we proudly proclaim, We are Marshall! Marshall. We are Marshall. It's a true story, it's simple, it's profound, and it never could have happened without head football coach Jack Langle. What I came to learn in telling this story is that an effective coach isn't just an inspired field marshal or a genius with X's and O's. The unifying theme with legendary coaches, the one main thing that they all have in common is compassion for their players and dedication to their team. Bowden shows us the power of personal connections to activate our will. That guy also understands his priorities. Pat Summit teaches that potential is realized through sustained, passionate effort. Lute Olson is a living example of how to deal with loss and how adversity can be the threshold to greatness. George Horton knows strategy like few others. He's not a man of dramatic speeches, but he knows how to keep a team focused on the few key things that separate the champions from all the rest. John Wooden is the truth. He's shown the world that the shortest path to excellence comes through cultivating a certain quality of being, and with that come not only victories, but wisdom. Each of these coaches provides a slightly different view to an overall plan to maximize the talent we all have. We've all got that talent. It just takes a coach like the guys you're going to hear from to bring it out of us. We start with Jack Langle himself, whose lasting victory was in getting his team to play the game just one more time. The rest, some of them household names, shared dozens of national championships between them. They are the greatest winners of all time. They truly are legendary coaches. I started at Marshall University and looked at our circumstances, we knew that there was not going to be instant success on the scoreboard. I did not realize, I thought I was rebuilding a football program, and I come to find out that there were 25 townspeople on the plane, uh, doctors and their wives, and uh, state legislators, vice presidents, leadership people within the community. So the university lost uh, some leadership as well as the football team, coaches, trainers, radio personnel, uh, and then the town lost a great deal of leadership. So it was a total situation. This is a letter I received right before the spring game. And it reads, Dear Coach Lengel, there will be a deep sense of sadness as Marshall University football begins again this season. But it will be mixed with warm pride that last year's freshmen have responded so positively to the great tragedy that struck your campus. The 1970 varsity players could have little greater tribute paid to their memory than the determination to field a team this year. Friends across the land will be rooting for you, but whatever the season brings, you have already won your greatest victory by putting the 1971 varsity squad on the field. Congratulations to you and every member of your team. Sincerely, Richard Nixon. I think that our program, starting with spring practice, uh, we have an opportunity to exemplify what I think is one of the greatest lessons in athletics, and that's to face adversity, get back up off the ground, and go on to continued success. The fact that we played the game and we were back was a victory. One of the traditions we started is before our first game, I would take the team to Spring Hill Cemetery, where the uh, obelisk is that has all of the 75 people that were on the plane their names inscribed on it. And I would explain to them, and particularly the 1971 Young Thundering Herd, uh, I told them, these are your teammates. These are the players that went on before you. 
These are the players that you're playing for and whose memory you're going to commit and, and do honor by rebuilding this particular program. And that while we may not have many victories uh, on the scoreboard, our victories will come in the years to come, in other years, and we will share in those victories knowing that we had some small part in building this foundation for this football team. You have to set your goals high, and if we had to go under it, we went under it. If we had to go around it, or if we had to jump over it, we did it. It was a team thing. It was a coaches, players, it was our goals. And once you immerse yourself into that particular philosophy and get everybody to buy into that system, uh, there's very little that you can't accomplish. Marshall has really never left me, and I've never left Marshall. We shared something very, very unique that has made us men and made us closer together. And I think it exemplifies hope, perseverance, dedication, loyalty, camaraderie. And as a byproduct, we have become part of those core values as well. I was raised in an area where the state championship team came every year, Birmingham, Alabama, Woodlawn High School. So all my life I heard a football being kicked. I heard boys playing. I heard coaches blowing whistles. I heard bands marching up and down the field. All my life that's what I knew. It was just automatic that I wanted to be a football coach. You know what we got coming up now? We got Miami. They won today. They're going to come in here about fourth in the nation or fifth. They're going to come here fourth or fifth in the nation. Well, let's pray. <laughs> People wonder what a head football coach does. Uh, really, he's the guy that sets the program, tells them how the program is going to work, how we're going to do it, and then oversees everybody. He doesn't coach. He coaches the coaches. We've got 85 guys out there. Some of the guys just work so hard. Some guys work kind of hard. And then some guys don't know how to work, you know? They're not used to being driven, you know? Well, that's, yeah, yeah, we all went through that one time or the other. There used to be an expression when I first started coming up and coaching. It was this, a coach talking to his players. Don't do like I do, do as I say do. And he'd go out and get drunk. <laughs> that's not my philosophy, that's never been my philosophy. My philosophy has always been when I coach, don't ask a boy to do something I wouldn't do. Anything I tell him to do, I, it's something that I hope that I would do if a coach told me. How you doing, man? Huh? Oh, y'all all dressed up. Shorty, how you doing? How you doing, coach? How do all your folks back home? They're doing really good. Yes, sir. I'm really a private guy. You know, if somebody says, oh, you, you must really enjoy being, going to all these meetings and shaking all those hands. You must really be, enjoy going to all these banquets. Well, no, I really don't. I'd like really be at home by myself reading, you know, and, and being with my family. But I make banquet after banquet after banquet, and so far I got them food, you know. <laughs> I've got them food. But the, I think a coach, most of us are probably more private. Most coaches don't run around together. A lot of times people say, who's your favorite coaching buddy? I ain't got a favorite coaching buddy, you know. I got to beat them dadgum guys, and they got to beat me. It's hard for us to get pretty close together. When everything else is equal on a football team and a team you're playing, it's usually which team has got the best leadership, you know? You simply are not going to win all the time. You're going to lose some, you know? And to me, a coach's success, somebody says, what do you have to do to be a successful coach? I say, you got to get over the bad times. If you never, a person who's wealthy and born wealthy and, and uh, never had to work and everything's handed to them, uh, I, I don't know how they keep them being worthless, you know, as they grow up. You're going to have adversity, you know. There's going to be times where you'll think you do not more deserve to be a football coach than a man in the moon, but you've got to overcome it. You've got to fight your way through it. You can't listen to the outside opinion. In football, you don't get many opportunities. Now, what is sad is when an opportunity comes and you ain't ready. It's sad when an opportunity comes and you did not prepare yourself to take advantage of that opportunity. My players, that uh, I tell them, I said, now boys, now look, your daddy's back home, 250, 500 miles from here. Your mama is too, they can't help you. I'm your daddy now. And so, yeah, they're like our children. 
Some of them we have to punish. Some of them we have to spank. Some of them we don't have to worry about. And uh, some of them don't like to go to class. We've got to make them and do this and that. But, oh, yes, there is a deep com uh, compassion from a coach to a player. And I'll be honest with you, if any coach doesn't have that, they're going to discover it. He's going to be looking for a job for long. You were fixing to find out what you were made of, you know? You were just fixing to find out what you were made of because you, you could have quit, you know? Then we come out and take it open and drive and go down there and don't get nothing. You could have quit then. And then going in the fourth quarter, you could have quit. But everybody fought and, and fought their guts out, and I am so proud of every one of you. I can't tell you how much. When I first started coaching back in the 50s, the approach that coaches took to football, a lot of them back then, was to kill. <laughs> kill, kill, go out there and kill them. Kill them. You got to be mean. You got to be riffing. You got to physically whip them and all that. And that was kind of the thing back in those days. But now then, our, our approach, and I think more coaches is love, love. In other words, if my players love each other, they have brotherly love for each other, then they'll fight for each other. Now you take brothers, you get two brothers, they'll fight like mad against each other. My four sons, I, I used to buy boxing gloves. Every time they get argued, all right, y'all solve it, you know? But you try to fight one of them from outside, you gotta, wipe, you gotta whip all four of them. And so you have got to have that on your team. That's why I think love is so important. If I don't like you, I ain't, I ain't gonna block. You think I'm gonna block that guy just so you can make a dog on a log on run? You know? But if I love him and I want him to succeed and he loves me, we're both gonna block for each other and we are gonna be a better team. You know what? Some coach is gonna go out there and be able to mold his team together as a team better than the others, and he's gonna win the national championship if he stays healthy. And so yeah, that's Back when I started coaching, you, you mentioned love on the football field, and somebody might forearm you right back up here in the stands. How you doing, Coach Which, B? You got the camera and everything in your face. I'm looking at it. I thought you'd I like that. I love this guy. I thought you'd, yeah, I thought you'd like that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't dwell on whether you're going to win or lose, you know, because you can sit there and talk yourself right out of a doggone ball game. You prepare yourself the best you can, and then we'll take a chance on what happens here, you know. In other words, number one, I try to keep football in the correct priority. Dear Father, thank you for a beautiful, what a beautiful day. Thank you for bringing us up here safely. And we pray, Father, that you'll help our young men to do their best. That's all they can do is their best. I'm continually reminding my kids, hey, boys, y'all ain't going to live forever. When you're your age, you think you're going to be an old man before you finally die. And I, last week, I had to remind them, we played Rice University. The next Monday, one of their players dropped dead, you know. So I have to bring that to my boys' attention. Men, you've got to be ready to go. You don't know when time is going to come, but it is going to come. Death and taxes. Death and taxes. Football is not the priority in my life. It is a priority. And it is a big one. It's the way I make my living, you know. But it ain't life and death. I ain't cutting my wrist because of a loss. I want him to come out of Florida State, better player, academically complete, and a very deep a realization that there's more to life than just football and a job.